Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. On March 18, 1965, Alexei Leonov became the first person to walk in space. Upon arrival to Earth, he and his crewmate were forced to land in the mountains in deep snow, with wolves surrounding and scratching at their partly open hatch. Much like this story, the AFL acted like Leonov, innovating professional football. It was the 1965 season though, when the AFL was like a wolf pack scratching at the doors of the NFL, with signing a contract with NBC for at the time a whopping $36 million. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. Great Scott. This time as we step up for DeLorean, the date is December 23rd, 1962, and we are at Jefferson Stadium in Houston, Texas. This happens to be the AFL championship game between the Dallas Texans and the Houston Oilers. This was a double overtime game, which at the time, that's the longest game in professional football history. So the buzz for the AFL was starting to build steam. You know, the whole chug, 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 chew. And a quote that came from uh, Robert Boyle from Sports Illustrated, kind of, I guess you could say, summed it up a little bit. It went as such. Pro football's new league confounds its doubters. Better teams, bigger crowds, newer stadiums, and fancy play now add up to a successful future for the league. Like I said, steam was building. But the AFL, they still had quite a few issues. You know, they had a long ways to go, even though they were starting to get to the point where they were challenging Big Brother, the NFL. The New York Titans at the time, they were struggling. Harry Wismer went bankrupt, so the team was about to go a bliff and, you know, leave the league. And we don't have any more team in New York City. And the AFL, they felt that a flagship franchise in New York City played a key role in the AFL survival. So Sonny Werblin organized a group to purchase the Titans franchise in 1963. This would help change the fortunes of the AFL because you have the big city. There's a lot of people there. If they can get into this rival football league, then maybe you have a chance. So they would name the team, they would change the name that is, from the New York Titans to the New York Jets. But this wasn't the only thing that they did. Sonny Werblin came from the entertainment industry. He would turn the game of professional football in New York from just a game to Showtime. So now you have Showtime, and later on we talk about Broadway Joe, and the Jets would bring more excitement to the game in New York City than the rivals. And he also helped put together that $36 million contract with NBC, which solidified the AFL's legitimacy as a professional football league. And at the time, Art Modell said that that agreement showed him that the AFL, they're not going anywhere. In fact, they said that they gave him five checks, totaling $1.25 million, and they would give them to five different teams at the AFL headquarters. This, of course, would be used to bring in top-level talent. And we talked about it before. The AFL, one of their biggest pressures was having, you know, good players to be able to present for the fans. If you don't have good players and you know you put on a good show, no one's going to want to watch you. So that was a huge direction given to the AFL owners, find the right players, but they had other things they had to deal with too. One thing that made the AFL more enticing to the fans 
was it was a wide open, exciting type of game. It was it was a different style than the NFL. I mean, the video that we're going to put on the, the show notes there says that it was as different as how you spell national and American. I mean, totally different ends of the spectrum. The video compared the NFL to a suit and tie, stand up straight, and the AFL to, you know, you're going to feel good and holler and shout, and you're going to see the players on the field do all sorts of things that you wouldn't even think about in the NFL. So it's kind of, like I said, changing from the football game to the showtime. And one of the persons that was greatly responsible for this went by the name of Sid Gilman. He was a revolutionary coach for the San Diego Chargers. He was said to have broken down film unlike anybody before. And he preached that, you know what, it's okay, let's just throw it all over the field. We can throw it anytime, anywhere, any place, when they're looking, when they're not. Anywhere on the field, at any time, any down, who cares? Throw that ball all over the park. And it didn't hurt that he had Lance Elworth on his team too, you know. I mean, John Madden just gushed about how the uh, innovations that Sid Gilman brought to the league helped revolutionize football and helped the American Football League step onto that pedestal. And to help you out, I left a link in the show notes to the incredible coaching tree of Sid Gilman and the impact that he had on the NFL. Which, by the way, you can get to the show notes through your podcast player here or head to my website at thefootballhistorydude.com. Also, please subscribe for free to the show by mashing that little subscribe button on your podcast player choice. That way you get the hottest, freshest out the press episodes each and every week. But getting back to the AFL and it wasn't meteoric at the beginning, but it turned into a meteoric rise of where they were legitimate with the big guys, the NFL. And there were many different reasons why this came about, but they had created this innovative style of play which included new rules for the AFL to add that excitement factor. Now, the first one was they started with 14-game regular season. At the time, the NFL still only had 12 games in the regular season. The AFL would add the names of the players on the back of jerseys. That way, when your player's streaking down the field, you can, you know, see it even more than just the number, and you can root for, well, talk about Lance Allworth, Allworth getting out on the field, and he had a nickname. They called him Bambi, which because of the way that he pranced and glided and, and, you know, the way he would just seem to bounce from one side to the next. It kind of reminded me of uh, back in the day we discussed the bonding antelope, you know. But getting back to some of the other types of rule changes that they implemented that helped improve the fans' experience. For instance, the AFL would use stadium scoreboard clocks so the fans could, you know, see what was going on. They actually knew how much was time was left in the game and if this drive that their team's on really mattered, it's like, you know, the, I'm using air quotes, the two minute drive. Before the NFL, they were just letting the referees keep stopwatches in their pocket to keep time. I mean, how can a fan know how much time is left unless they themselves are keeping these pocket watches and stopwatches and they're the ones that are trying to figure out what's going on? I mean, to me, that was a huge one because you want the fans to be able to engage with the game and understand down and distance and time and that kind of thing. So why not put it up on this big scoreboard for everyone to see? Of course, this was one of the rules that was immediately implemented after the merger. The other two that I discussed, the 14-game season and the names on the back of the jerseys, were immediately acquired and implemented by the NFL as well after the merger. But another rule change for the AFL that was dissimilar to the NFL, which was not adopted at, you know, the implementation of the merger, was the two-point conversion. The AFL, they understood that there could be an added excitement factor if you decide to go for the two-point as opposed to kick an extra point. So they would implement it right away. However, it would take the NFL until 1994 to adopt this rule, which college ranks had adopted it back in like the 50s or something like that. The AFL also had a different shaped ball. It was a little bit, I guess you could call it skinnier and longer. The reason for it was to help improve the passing attack. You know, they wanted to be able to pass it all over the ballpark and be able to throw bombs from anywhere. And that was part of the excitement style of play. And with these added colorful jerseys and such, he had the the style factor like Sid Gilman. Bomb it all over the place. Strike force from anywhere on the field. You know, not like that conservative style of those old NFL guys over there. But as we see nowadays, you know, with all these passing records being broken and such, 
That was what the fan wanted. The fans were interested in this excitement factor of toss the ball all over the park. We talked about it before. Last year's Super Bowl between the Patriots and the Eagles and all those yards and touchdowns and points and such. And that was regarded as one of the better Super Bowls in NFL history. So the other thing that I wanted to bring up, though, was the AFL was also progressive in giving chances to black athletes more than the NFL at the time. Uh, There were some deep-rooted things that were going on from the beginning with George Preston Marshall and various kind of uh, racist viewpoints and things like that. But the AFL was not like that. They were all inclusive. So they would often recruit from smaller and then predominantly black colleges as well. And we talked about this at the All-Star game there in the early 60s where they were trying to have it down in New Orleans and they were having issues where they couldn't even you know, stay in the same hotels or eat at the same restaurants. Like, well, screw you guys. You know, it's, it's all of us or none of us. So they bounced. They went over to Houston. And that was something that the AFL helped bring into the NFL when they were merged. So there's that social factor, too, that has really helped the league continue to grow. And I guess you could say just, you know, do the right thing. But getting into the reason why the AFL had that chance to be I don't want to say begged, but kind of begged by the NFL to have that merger. Now, there were many turning points in the history of the AFL that helped create this true competition between the two leagues. Now, earlier we talked of that contract that would start in the 1965 season where NBC would pay the AFL $36 million. But to give you an idea of what some of the NFL owners thought at that time, there was a quote where Art Rooney, after hearing this, you know, this announcement, He said to the then Commissioner Pete Rizal, well, they don't have to call us Mr. anymore. I mean, think about that. The NFL is now considering the AFL, maybe not as a peer, maybe not on the same page, but they're starting to, like I said before, they're shaking in their britches a little bit. You know, they got to worry. They can't just keep status quo because if they do, they could be, you know, on the same plane, the same playing field, or they could even be taken over, which no one wanted that in the NFL. So they had to figure something out. Another thing that the AFL knew that they had to do better than the NFL. I mean, they talked about having the better players, you know, come into their their teams and such. And how they just had to straight create better teams overall competition within the AFL. But ultimately, they knew that this would not cut the mustard in the fight against the NFL. They needed new stadiums. So one of the stadiums, that definitely helped move this forward was November of 1965. There was a referendum that was passed to allow the construction of a new stadium in San Diego. This new stadium would cost $27 million. Now that vote from the city, the citizens and such, it was overwhelmingly yes. So this means that they believed in the Chargers and they also believed in the AFL as a legitimate team slash league kind of thing. So the AFL at the time, they ended up having more new stadiums than the NFL did. We, we talked about it before. The money that the AFL owners had you know, surpassed the money that the NFL owners had. So we're starting to see that, I don't want to say that they're buying their way in, but they as businessmen were able to recognize different things and what was important to be able to create a positive trajectory for the AFL. And at the time, even though money contracts were becoming bigger and and TV contracts and such like that, they still recognized the way to win was the ticket gate. You had to have those seats in the seats. We talked about Sonny Werblin earlier, where he took over the New York Titans and would transform them into the New York Jets. Now, he helped build a new stadium, which was called Shea Stadium, in New York City, which would be shared with the Mets. So what did he do? being an entertainment industry type guy that he was, he knew he needed a star to put in that stadium. That star would be none other than Mr. Joe Namath, whom he signed for $427,000 over four years, which at the time, that's a huge number. But going to the war between players and the leagues and trying to, you know, pluck the players for a year specifically and that kind of thing, He was also drafted by the Cardinals, but the NFL, no, they did not stand a chance because Werblin wanted a show and he knew that Namath would be his front man. 
So he was just going to toss money at him like nobody's business. Now, discussing what Joe Namath thought about this, here's a quote from Namath uh, on the contract, and it went as such. When I first met with Mr. Werblin, he didn't ask what I wanted. He said, Joe, we're going to give you this. I know it's better than their offer. We want you. I don't want to bicker over dollars and cents. He said, you take this and come work with us. We want you in New York, but just for openers. He was ahead of whatever I had dreamt about. I could remember getting in a coffee shop back in Tuscaloosa with the buddy and looking at each other saying, Do you believe this? Do you believe this much money? So even Broadway Joe himself never dreamt about having that kind of money for playing professional football. However, he was not Broadway Joe at the time. But he would, under Sonny Werblin's direction, blessing, and guidance, become Broadway Joe. I mean, they had songs about him. The fans loved him. The league loved him. And he was just, at the time, straight up, the dude. And you have to believe that the lore and legend of Broadway Joe definitely helped create the AFL's legitimacy and possibility for having a merger with the NFL in the future. But as I pointed out, that was a lot of money to give to a player. Just for, you know, one player on the team which caused an issue for the leagues. There's a quote from Dan Jenkins of Sports Illustrated that kind of indicated the potential of a merger, um, and that had to do with money, and it went as such. It cannot be denied that both of the AFL and NFL owners have been drawn irresistibly together by that great equalizer, money, or the rather, the loss of it. So as we discussed, the legitimacy of the AFL creating this bidding war for players Salaries rising, causing financial burden on both leagues. I mean, things were starting to head uh, kind of in the wrong direction for the NFL, and they knew it. And Al Davis, now he had a perspective on how they could just kind of hold out, wait them out. And it went as such. As I've often said, we were like the gorillas in guerrilla warfare. And as I've also often said, the gorilla wins if he doesn't lose. And as long as we hung around, We were a thorn in their side. They feared us, and we had quality people. We weren't afraid of them, and we could handle them. And speaking of this kind of guerrilla warfare type thing, something that didn't turn out, it was a little sour for the AFL at the time. Remember when we talked about in the last episode, actually two episodes ago even, where the Bills, their kicker, Gogolak, he was taken away by the NFL. AFL, they would go on a rampage, signing players away from the NFL. And again, Al Davis, he focused on the field generals, those quarterbacks, because he knew if he could get their quarterbacks, the leaders of the field, he would have a chance to win this guerrilla warfare that he embarked upon. But between this guerrilla warfare mentality and signing players from each other, I mean, the merger, because of this, almost didn't happen. But at the same time, probably one of the reasons why it did happen, because it gave from Al Davis's perspective, it gave Lamar Hunt more ammunition when they go into meetings and, and have these conversations and things with the NFL. But then this all led up to the merger, which we've discussed in a previous episode, so we won't go into detail. But it also takes us to what would end up becoming the first Super Bowl. I mean, not really technically called the Super Bowl at the time. It was the world championship game between the AFL and the NFL. But a little bit more on that in a later episode. So we have to talk about, of course, Broadway Joe, because he helped create the AFL's legitimacy. And another thing, this is after the merger, but in Super Bowl III, he had the guarantee where the betting line was started at the Colts being favored by 17 points. His Jets didn't stand a chance, the inferior AFL league, and that kind of thing. And he's like, you know what? Wait a minute, man. I guarantee we're going to win this game. So it was a laughing matter, a laughing stock, and no one believed him, of course, because of the dominant Baltimore Colts. They're just going to stroll, scramp, strap all over him. And this was not on purpose, but it kind of reminded me of last Super Bowl as well. Patriots coming in, supposed to be this dominant team playing against the Eagles and their backup quarterback. Nick Foles didn't usher a guarantee, but the same thing kind of happened. They came out on top. But this was even more important as far as legitimacy as the American Football League would go. This would mark the first time the American Football League would win a championship against the NFL, creating 
that final moment where it's like, yes, we finally made it. Yeah, we've got the merger going on and that kind of thing. But we as players, teams, coaches, we believe that we belong here. Joe Namath talked about it. He said that, you know, all the AFL players, they felt like they won that game, even though they weren't on the Jets at the time. And he spoke of Chiefs players that hugged him when he got off the plane because it was collective, you know, like we talked about their camaraderie before. They believed this underdog story. Now we're here. We're with the NFL. We finally won one. Even though we're going to merge, we still have the AFC and the NFC. But as all good things come to an end, the last true AFL game, which before the merger of the 1970 season, came on January 17th, 1970 at Astro Dome in Houston, Texas. Now, I didn't really confirm this, but I saw where it said that rookie O.J. Simpson carried the ball in the very last play of the AFL. So going to um, remembering the AFL and the players and that kind of thing, there was just a, a small group of players. There were 19 of them that they called the Originals that played in all 10 seasons of the AFL. In total, there were approximately 1,500 total players on rosters during the AFL's 616 total games. Pro Football Hall of Fame. Now, there are 33 members that played in the AFL that would end up becoming members of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. However, there's only one player that spent his entire career in the American Football League, and that was a guard by the name of Billy Shaw of the Buffalo Bills. With that being said, the story of the American Football League could be considered as great as any Cinderella story out there. Many leagues were born only to be burnt at the feet of the NFL. The AFL played a different tune, taking on the founded NFL in a way unlike any before. A good way to sum it up comes from Lamar Hunt, and it went as such. To me, it's the epitome of the American dream. We made it despite the odds. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode of the Football History Dude and were able to gain some knowledge nuggets about the history of the American Football League. In the upcoming episode, we go way back to discuss the first playoff game in NFL history, considering the NFL playoffs are upon us. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.